Howdy, it's Kyle talking about the eight worst places in the US. And right off the bat, I wanna say this isn't intended to be a funny video. I'm not here to make fun of these places or the people that live there, but just give a general overview of some of these really bad places in the country. And a lot of us, including myself, live a pretty cushy life where we don't experience these places or this lifestyle firsthand. And for millions of Americans, this is what they experience every single day. These are the places that people live. And a lot of us are just completely oblivious to the other America. So in this video, I want to count down the eight worst places in the entire country. All of these aren't going to be a big shock to you. A lot of Americans know that some of these places I'm going to mention are just truly awful places, but you know, other ones might be a bit of a surprise to you. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to first start talking about the worst urban ghettos. Not all urban ghettos are created equal. And I'm going to talk about the three worst ones the largest one, the most dangerous one, and the poorest one. And they aren't all the same. So I'm gonna start with the largest one, which is Detroit. Detroit has the single largest area of just continuous urban blight in the entire country. And so much of the city is empty, derelict, and just truly ghetto. And a lot of it, you can't even really call it ghetto because it's just empty. It's almost like an urban ghost town. And it's just really bad. It's improved a little bit through the years. I've been visiting Detroit for about 20 years and there have been some minor improvements, but it's still really, really bad. And so many stretches of town are just, you know, again, they're just empty and derelict and they're starting to do things with some of the old factories and with some of these, you know, old plants and things, but it's been a very slow process. And in 20 years, not that much has been done. So, but the past couple of years have seen a little bit of improvement, but still Detroit is truly awful and is the largest urban ghetto in the country. The most dangerous urban ghetto is Chicago, and the stats here are ridiculous. The south and west side of the city have just seen almost like war zone type activities going on, and the gang-related murders, the violence going on there is incredible. Something you would expect to find in, say, Brazil or places like that. It's just truly, truly bad, and I haven't actually been through the worst parts of the ghetto in recent years when it's gotten really, really bad. I probably wouldn't either, but... You know, it is mostly gang on gang violence. So if I were to drive through there, I probably wouldn't have any issues. But at the same time, I still wouldn't be doing it. It's crazy. I don't know how it's gotten so much worse through the years, but it is such a huge area of just violence. And it is the most dangerous ghetto in the country, even though I guess you could say per capita, the crime isn't as bad as say maybe St. Louis or other cities. But Chicago is so much bigger than St. Louis that the ghetto is just so much larger and the overall amount of violence is incredible. But the difference between Chicago and Detroit is that not all of Chicago is like that. A lot of Chicago is very nice, very wealthy, and some really cool neighborhoods there. Most of Detroit is pretty ghetto. There isn't much to Detroit that isn't nasty. Most of Chicago is at least okay, but the, the parts of town that are ghetto are really bad and really violent, and it's the most violent inner city in the country. But neither Detroit nor Chicago are the poorest ghetto in the country. That goes to New Orleans. And New Orleans' ghetto is more like a third world area. It's just really bad. It's just so much more poverty stricken than the larger ones up north. But the only saving grace for New Orleans' ghetto is that it isn't huge. It doesn't go on for miles and miles and miles. But pound for pound, it is the worst. It really does feel like you're in a third world country. It's just so bad and so poor. And so, and it's not just because of Hurricane Katrina. It was like that before. And there was talking, sort of joking, sort of serious, that Hurricane Katrina might be in the long term good for New Orleans as it cleaned out some of these horrible below sea level areas, the Ninth Ward specifically. And there's been some new building there, some green kind of construction and things going on. But the overall ghetto scene in New Orleans is still very, very bad. And it's a lot poorer than Chicago or Detroit. But again, the overall ghetto size isn't anywhere near as big. So those are the three worst urban ghettos in the country. Detroit's the largest, Chicago's the most dangerous, and New Orleans is the poorest. And these are often associated with high crime and poverty, but urban ghettos are not as destitute as some other parts of the country. So urban areas aren't the only horrible parts of the U.S. Some of the rural parts of the country are where you have the most third world, the most poverty, and just the most destitution. So now I'm going to talk about the three worst rural parts of the country. The first of these rural areas I'm going to talk about is eastern Kentucky slash southwestern West Virginia. And this is just a huge area of almost continuous poverty. Whereas an urban ghetto might constitute a few neighborhoods over several miles in a city, this part of Appalachia is several counties that goes across state lines and it's just a huge area where you can drive for over an hour and never really leave an area of poverty. There's a very tiny middle class and almost no upper class. A lot of people in this region don't have running water or electricity, which sounds crazy for a rich country like the US, but it's true. 
You can live in the worst ghetto of Detroit or Chicago, but you probably have electricity or running water. You might not be able to pay the bill for the electricity, but the infrastructure is there. A lot of these places in the rural Appalachia region, the infrastructure isn't even there in the first place. This area is so large that you might have to drive a half an hour just to get to a grocery store. And when you get there, it only has frozen, boxed, and canned stuff. You might have to drive more than an hour just to get to a decent hospital. This area is a huge food desert. It's a huge healthcare desert. Healthcare problems are really bad. Obesity is really bad. Dental hygiene is really bad. A lot of the drinking water isn't even safe. I mean, it smells weird. It looks weird. And half the time I go to West Virginia, there's always some county there where there's a boil water advisory to not drink the water. That's an extremely common thing. So these areas are really, really bad. And almost like I said, third world-ish because it's just extreme poverty. For, it's a large region. And you also have a huge issue with drugs. You have a lot of people that are hooked on painkillers and crystal meth, and it's really sad. I've walked around some of these small towns in southwestern West Virginia, like a town called Logan, and you just see so many people whose eyes are glazed, and they're kind of shuffling their feet, and they look like zombies. It's just, it's just so sad that how many people are just hooked into this cycle of poverty and drugs, and it doesn't really seem to be getting any better. In fact, it seems to be getting a little bit worse. The second awful rural area that takes up a large swath is the Mississippi River area of northwestern Mississippi and southeastern Arkansas. This is just, again, just true poverty through a large area, and it's also kind of third world -ish. You have a lot of areas where there's no electricity or running water, and you, know, you see people living in these conditions. You can't believe this is the U.S., but it is. And this area has been poor forever, going back to the days of slavery and sharecropping, and just this area hasn't really ever improved. And this is where the blues music came from. I mean, you can see why it came from this area. So, so much of our music is because of how bad this area is. People had the blues, singing about it, and it just moved into rock and roll and all that kind of stuff. So, I guess you can say there's one good thing about the poverty in this area, but it is still very destitute. It's very similar to the Appalachian area, but, you know, the geography is different. It's flat, really hot and humid as opposed to mountainous and stuff but it is pretty much the same kind of thing just a large area of just extreme poverty and it never seems to get much better there's very little economic opportunity in this region it's not like there's any companies moving to northwestern mississippi or southeastern arkansas so what the future holds for this area i don't know it's kind of like appalachia they can't just keep holding on the coal it's, it's going away so what are these areas doing to improve themselves i don't know but for right now it's really bad and kind of like the appalachia area it's not really getting any better and the last of the three rural areas I'm going to mention is by far the worst one. And this is the Pine Ridge Reservation of the Lakota Sioux in southwestern South Dakota. The level of poverty on the reservation is astonishing. It's almost unbelievable. I've driven through it a couple of times on my trips to Badlands National Park and some of the other areas in southwestern South Dakota. And you just can't believe you're in the U.S. when you see some of this stuff. You see people living in burned out buses, old RVs houses made from pallets i mean half a time you can't tell if somebody actually lives there until you see an electric meter on the side of this burned out bus with the dials turning so it's i mean it's crazy that people live in these kind of conditions and again it's it's kind of embarrassing that this is the u.s and these are the indigenous population and they're living in some of these horrible conditions but it was bad as a native population has been treated through the years this is the absolute worst reservation in the country the poverty is astonishing and Kind of like you have the painkiller problem in the Appalachia region, you have an alcoholism problem on the reservation. And of course, people make the jokes about the drunk Indian kind of stuff, but it, it really is sad. I mean, you see people just staggering around, people just passed out in front of a building. And you drive through some of these towns and you, it's like, is this a movie set? Is this really what this place is like? And it isn't all entirely like that, but most of it is. And the better parts of the reservation would still be extremely poor for most of the country. And the last two that I'm going to mention are on this list because of how strange they are. I don't mean strange in a good way, like Santa Cruz, California, Burlington, Vermont, or Key West, Florida. I mean strange in a bad way. The first are the twin cities of Hilldale, Utah, and Colorado City, Arizona. This is basically one town that straddles the state line. And this is the area that's well known for being the home of the fundamentalist wing of the Mormon church. The best word I can think of to describe these two towns is creepy. And I've been there a few times. The first time was about 15 years ago or so before the cult leader Warren Jeffs was arrested. The second time was not long after he was arrested. And the third time was just a couple years ago, you know, several years after he was arrested. So I've gotten to see how much the town has changed and how much it hasn't changed. 
It's hard to say for sure, but I would estimate about 75% of the population there are members of the FLDS church. And it's really easy to point them out because they all look the same, they all dress the same, and they all have the same hairstyle. And I'm not trying to be joking around here, but they're also kind of inbred. There's such a small number of people that are part of this church and they're only getting with each other. The gene pool just isn't that large. So a lot of people just kind of have the same facial features and they all look the same. So it's just, again, really creepy. But for the longest time, it wasn't just creepy, it was also scary because the city was officially a fundamentalist city. The mayor, the city council, and most frighteningly, the police were all part of this cult. And there were many, many stories of people that were not members of the church being harassed by the police, arrested for no reason, evicted from their homes. And the worst story I ever heard was one where the police rounded up all the dogs of the non-FLDS members and killed them en masse. And if you're a non-FLDS member living there, who are you going to complain to? The police? The mayor? Obviously not. They're the problem. And the state of Utah has always said we don't condone these polygamy cults, but they've also always looked the other way because this, of course, was known to be going on for the longest time in these cities, but the state did absolutely nothing about it. And it wasn't until some young girls came out and said that Warren Jeffs raped them that the state finally had to do something about it. So he was arrested, tried and convicted, and he's now currently in prison. But things didn't stop. He was still running the cult, still running the town from prison. I think his brother was acting as the liaison for him, and things didn't change at all for several years, even after he was arrested. In the past few years, the police have been broken up. There's a new mayor. There are real elections. But the last time I was there, it still had that kind of creepy feel to it. So I'm sure it's gotten better, but it still didn't seem quite right. And a lot of the folks from the FLDS church have moved. They're starting to go to other places, trying to take over other towns. But, you know, I think things have probably certainly improved for the non-FLDS members of that town. But it is still really creepy there. And I know I said at the beginning that this isn't trying to be a funny video, but this last one is kind of funny. That's because of how ridiculous it is. And that's Bombay Beach, California. It is a beach, but it isn't along the ocean. It's along the Salton Sea in the southeastern corner of the state, out in the middle of the desert. It's below sea level. It's the lowest community in the U.S. And it's just truly, truly awful, but also really, really strange. The Salton Sea isn't supposed to exist. It's there because of a levee that broke and the water just kept running down and this formed this lake. So when it first happened, it was like, oh, great. There's this oasis in the desert. We're going to form these beach resort towns. And Bombay Beach was one of them. So at one point, it was kind of a place to go to go to the beach, hang out, get a burger, get a few beers. But it is nothing like that anymore. But as the resort aspect of it went away, the water was getting more and more polluted People weren't going there anymore, so people were moving out of the town. So it kind of has a ghost town feel through a lot of it. There's empty shells of buildings. There's just random cars here and there. There's furniture and appliances all over the place. There are pianos, just stuff that when people left, they didn't take with them. A lot of the folks that remained took some of those old buildings, just kind of made like weird artistic stuff out of it, like turned old beams into like shapes and things. And just, it's just so weird. And there's like a little stage out there where they'll do live plays and there's like a drive-in where a bunch of old cars are facing a movie screen. It is just a incredibly weird place. So if you're driving through this part of the country, check this place out because it's just so absurd. There's nowhere else like it in the country. And it's almost like the people that live there revel in the absurdity. They love it. This isn't the same as these poverty-stricken areas in these other parts of the country. I mean, these are not rich people, but they want to be there. These are just really weird people on the fringe of society. And if you're on the fringe of society, there can't be many better places to go than Bombay Beach. But what about the beach itself? Is it nice? No, it is like the most awful beach you'll ever go to. It looks nice and white. You walk out there and it's not sand. It's all dead fish, scales, fish bones. It's horrible. The water is so polluted that it can't even sustain any life. So these fish just wash up and you can imagine how that smells. And as awful as it smells, there is someone that's going to love it, your dog. I was there with my dog and he was having a time of his life. His nose was up in the air. He was like, wow, these are the greatest smells ever. He loved it. But no matter how much your dog will love it, you will hate the smell. It is putrid. So those are the eight worst places in the country. And this isn't really even an opinion. You can live in these places and be like, oh no, this place sucks. But 
you know, I could say like, I hate Orlando because I do, but a lot of people love Orlando. And I could say I hate Los Angeles and I do, but a lot of people love it. These eight places, no, these places really suck. And there's really not much you could say to defend these places. They are just truly monumentally awful. One of the questions I asked myself as I was putting this video together is, if I absolutely had to live in one of these eight places, where would I live? And that's a good question to ask yourself. And I would love to know in the comment section, what do you think? Where would you live if you had to live in one of these? You have to have a strong tolerance for something. So which of these places would you be most likely to tolerate? I hope you found the information in this video useful. If you did, please give me a thumbs up to let me know you approve and subscribe to this channel. I don't post that many videos and they're usually about stuff like this, geography, road tripping, travel across the US, just interesting stuff that a lot of people on YouTube aren't really talking about. But yeah, thanks for watching. Geography King signing out.